ways to honor the reading of God's word. I, um, yeah, I'll read the text and then give you the disclaimers, all right? So here's the text, Philippians 3, one of the most brilliant passages in the New Testament. My beloved ones, don't ever limit your, don't, do not limit your joy or fail to rejoice in the wonderful experience of knowing our Lord Jesus. I don't mind repeating what I've already written you because it protects you. Beware of hypocrites who teach you that you need to be circumcised to please God. For we have already experienced the circumcision of the heart and we worship God in the power and freedom of the Holy Spirit, not in laws and religious obligations. We are those who boast in what Jesus has done. Not in what we can accomplish in our own strength. It's true. I once relied, Paul, Paul talking here, I once relied on all that I'd become. I had a reason to boast and impress people with my accomplishments more than others for my pedigree was impeccable. And we won't take time to read about his pedigree, but basically he was of the best tribe and he was from the elite university and he had done all kinds of cool things and he boasted in all those things, but we'll pick up after he did all his boasting. Verse 9, my passion is to be consumed with him and not clinging to my own righteousness based in keeping the written law. My righteousness will be this, will be his based on the faithfulness of Jesus, the very righteousness that comes from God. And I continually long to know the wonders of Jesus more fully and to experience the overflowing power of his resurrection working in me. Are you kidding I will be one with him in his sufferings and I will be one with him in his death. Only then will I be able to experience complete oneness with him in his resurrection from the realm of death. I admit I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing. But I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the purpose that Jesus Christ has called me to fulfill and wants me to discover. I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past as I fasten my heart to the future. I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. So let all who are fully mature have this same passion. And if anyone is not yet gripped by these desires, God will reveal it to them. And let us all advance together to reach this victory prize following one path with one passion. This, dear friends, is God's word. You may be seated. So I, I have disclaimers for this message. Um, for those of you who may not know, my father passed away on Wednesday of this week. It was actually just a few moments before I began to preach the 7 o'clock service on Easter that I received a text from my mom saying that they were taking him to the emergency room. And so he was in the emergency room Sunday, Monday. We took him home on Tuesday, and, uh, and he passed away on, on Wednesday. So it's been a hectic week. It's, we've been trying to say goodbye to Dad. We've been planning his funeral, a lot of, di- a lot of different things. And uh, so I have my heart wrapped into this message, but I don't have all my subjects and verbs put together. Um, so I'm going to have what I call a pastoral talk. If, you, if you're a guest and you're like, oh, I think he could probably preach a better sermon, maybe that's true, but feel my passion about what I'm going to share with you today, please. In fact, um, my dad actually, for those of you who were at the funeral, forgive me for repeating this, but my dad actually preached his own funeral last Father's Day, and we recorded that. When he was preaching this message, I I leaned over to Beck and I said, said, if he passes, we're going to play this at his funeral. And um, so I'm going to encumber you with this video, Watch, watch dad preach last Father's Day. In the day of the withering of the fig tree, he said, have faith in God. Have faith in God. Good news or bad news? 
Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Favorable report or negative report? Say it with me. Have faith in God. Hope in the natural or hopelessness in the natural? Have faith in God. Life or death, you're a winner. You're a winner. That's what the Holy Spirit was saying to me because I know that my heavenly Father has prepared a place for me in heaven. And so if I die, I'm in heaven. If I stay here, he's going to see me through because I have faith in God. And I want to I want to leave the manuscript for just a moment and say regardless of what you're going through regardless of what the enemy says regardless of what your neighbor may say regardless of what the doctor may say don't you abandon your faith in God you hold on to God God's in control God's on the throne God has not forsaken his people God God is not on vacation. Hallelujah. Have faith in God, church. Have faith in God. Oh, church, church, church. If the devil can separate us from our faith, uh, if the devil can tell us God's an angry God, uh, if the devil can tell us God doesn't love you, if the devil can tell us that God's on vacation, uh, if the devil can tell us uh, that God has abandoned uh, you as an individual, uh, then he's won the battle. Uh, but, oh, we're not going to allow the devil to win the battle. Uh, we're going to have faith in God. Shout it out. Faith in God. Hallelujah. That's the key to victory. <laughs> Dad would be pleased that we finally got a new pulpit that would hold his notes because every time he preached, they kept falling off. You know, context is everything. When Dad preached that message on Father's Day, he already had learned that the chemotherapy treatments that we had hoped would turn the assault of the cancer, we had hoped that the, the chemo would have an effect, but he knew as he's preaching this message that, in fact, that was not going to be the case. And yet, in the middle of that, he's telling us to have faith in God. And that he's going to be a person of victory, whether he lives or whether he dies. And, and you know, not to make this about dad, but that's who, that's who he was. He, he, he had victory. He has victory. You know, context is everything. Paul's writing from a prison jail, for goodness sake. He's been beaten for preaching the gospel. And he's writing a letter to Christians just like us, telling us how we can have limitless joy. From a, from a prison cell. And Paul is a pretty seasoned believer by now. Um, he's participated in high-level miracles. He's been on mission trips. He's planted churches. He's cast out a lot of demons. But watch this. His self-awareness involves a motto that kind of goes like this. I know there's more for me. I mean, he says, I, I press toward something. You can almost hear it in Paul's language. He's, he's like, I'm so grateful for the grace that has come to me. And it's a lot of grace. How many of you are grateful for the grace that's come to you? Paul's like, I've had, I've had so much grace. And yet, even though I've received so much grace, he's like, I'm pressing on for something else. I know there is more. Let me just say this to you. It is not natural for a believer not to want more of God's glory. I mean, you can tell when someone is ill. I learned this from, from the battle with cancer. You can, you can tell when someone is ill when they lose their appetite. If they're not, if they're not eating, there's trouble. And, and can I just tell you, I mean, probably not the 11 o'clock service. I'll talk about the 9 o'clock service. Listen, there's a lot of people who are coming to church, but they've lost their spiritual hunger. And, and if there is no desire in you today to press towards something that you do not have in God, that is a vital sign that you need to be concerned about. 
can I talk to you directly today? I mean, I couldn't believe the choir sang it. I had no idea they would sing. You know, something's moving, something's changing. See his, see his glory. I think it was two weeks ago in this service because I told the 9 o'clock service and they, they looked at me like, no, that did not happen here. So it was obviously the 11 o'clock service where it happened. We began to sing the, the, the song Glory. We sang the song and, and, you know, the glory of God came into our midst. That's a technical word. Glory is a technical word and it describes the splendor and the wonder and the beauty and the joy when God manifests himself in an unusual way. It's like brilliance of his presence comes uh, among us and, and, and the glory of God is always against, it's against the enemies, it's for us, it's, it's bringing strength and joy and awareness. Glory brings awareness of who God is and who we are in God. And, and on that Sunday, as the glory of God came into our midst, there was a revelation, and I, and I spoke, I began to teach you things that I didn't even know myself. I began to teach you that there is one source of glory, but two locations for glory. And, and, and what I mean by that is Jesus told his followers that he had put heaven's glory in our lives. John 17, 22, Jesus said, Father, I've given them our glory. Are you, are you kidding me? I've given them our glory. I've given them the honor that you have given me. We are houses for the glory of God, church. We are houses for the glory of God. That explains what's going on in, in Acts chapter um, 7, where Stephen is being stoned to death by the religious police for his testimony of his love of Christ. And, and I'll just read from the scripture. It says, Stephen was overtaken with great faith and he was full of the Holy Spirit and he fixed his gaze into the heavenly realm. He fixed his gaze into the heavenly realm. Context is everything. Paul is in prison. My dad is in cancer. Stephen is receiving stones into his body. He fixed his gaze into the heavenly realm and saw the glory and splendor of God. stone, I see the glory and the splendor of God. Look, Stephen said, I see heaven's opening and the Son of Man standing. Stephen's testimony in the middle of being stoned is, I see the glory of God. But listen to this, <laughs> the glory of God was being seen by the people who were throwing the stones on Stephen. Stephen's face was reflecting the glory of God. The Bible says they covered their ears and they began to scream to drown out his words. But he, they're going crazy because they see the glory of God on, on Stephen and he peacefully commits his life into the spirit, into, into the presence of God. I'm just trying to get you to see that the glory of God comes into the earth through human beings like us. It's in heaven and it's in the earth. 2 Corinthians 3, 18 says, with no veil, we all become like mirrors who brightly reflect the glory of Jesus. I'm just talking to you. Is it okay? We are being transfigured into his very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another. And this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Paul's attitude, I want it to be our attitude. Paul is, I am so grateful for what God has done for me. And I know he's done a lot, but I am not going to stay in this level of glory. There's another level of glory that I will press toward. Now, <clears throat> I told the campuses in the early service that candidly, I resisted the idea of having multiple locations because it's hard enough to keep up with everything here. But I see it different now because what I see is that the campus we have in Fair Meadows and the campus we have in Waxahachie, I can see those now as locations of the glory of God. Um, Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Do you like the Bible? Because you're getting a lot of it today. <clears throat> now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power at work in us, to him be, watch this, glory in the church 
Where's the glory? In the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and forever. See the locations of the glory. The, the glory is in Christ Jesus, and it's in the church, and it's in this generation and the next generation, and it's now and it's forever. There are multiple locations for the glory of God. So our dream is to have a location for the glory in Waxahachie and a location for the glory in the Oak, Oak Cliff, Duncanville area, and a location for the glory in Cedar Hill, and where generational glory, I'm excited about this. I, I, I might, I might end up preaching instead of talking. Jesus turned the water into wine, and he said, this is for my glory. The woman touched the hem of his garment and was healed after many, many years of infirmity, and what she actually touched was the glory of God. The priest in Solomon's temple couldn't even receive tithe and offering on that particular day when the glory came because they did not have a structural protocol to handle the manifestation of God. It says the priest fell on their faces in the presence of the mighty. <laughs> the glory of God came into the temple. Jesus told Mary and Martha after Lazarus came stumbling out of a tomb after four days dead. He said, I told you we'd see the glory of God if you would believe. Haggai said the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the glory of the former. John said we've seen the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. I'm just trying to get you to know that the vision of heaven is for an ever-increasing manifestation of glory in the earth. What heaven wants is for the glory that is in heaven to visit the people who are in the earth, to be in the church, the glory of God to be in the church. And when we, as the people of God, who are stewarding the glory of God, settle for, when we settle for the levels of glory that we've previously experienced are historical levels of God's glory. When the glory doesn't grow, it petrifies it institutionalizes it. It, it, becomes, it becomes religion. That's why I'm so excited. I'm so thankful for my, my Beck already mentioned it, but, the, but our, our, our children, and I, I don't mean that in an insulting way like they're little babies or anything, but I'm so proud of, you know, what, what Taylor did with social girls this week, 400 ladies gathering, and, you know, one testimony that comes from from social girls this week is that, is that there was a young lady who was an atheist and she said, I'm still an atheist, but I have no explanation for what has happened to me tonight. <laughs> I love that. And, and the documentary that Beck referenced from Forgiven Felons, it was just the story about the transfiguration of people, the changing of people who, in, who encounter the glory of God, the presence of of God, even at Dad's funeral yesterday, those of you who were here, the presence of God was so palpable. So, so all that to ask this simple question: What kind of church do we want to be? Because my answer to that question is a church of ever increasing glory. <clears throat> you know, I, I hear Paul's heart as he writes this letter in Philippians three. I hear his heart. It makes me think of my dad a lot. You know, Paul says in verse 10, I continually long to know the wonders of Jesus more fully and to experience the overflowing power of his resurrection working in me. Verse 12, he says, I run with passion toward his abundance so that I may reach the purpose that Jesus has called. Listen, there's a purpose over us, y'all. And he's... I, the purpose that Jesus called me to fulfill and he wants me to discover. I mean, I'm asking myself the question, what am I running toward now? Been here 25 years, guys. What am I running toward now with passion for abundance? Because I, the great danger, the great danger of people who have been raised in Texas hanging out with religion all of our lives, the great danger is that we would settle for a level of glory. We would settle for slavery. We would settle for wilderness. We would settle for areas of small dominion when the, God's heart is to reveal high levels of his glory into the earth, into the people that he calls his church. So what kind of church do we want to be? 
I'm going to answer the question out of Paul's third chapter to the Philippian church. I think what kind of church, what kind of church grows the glory is really the question. Number one, a word church. A word church. He says in verse one, I don't mind repeating what I've already written, written to you because it protects you. And he says, beware of the hypocrites who teach you that you should be circumcised to please God. You know, last Easter, last Easter, yes, last week, it seems like a year ago already, but it was such a week, but just seven days ago, you know, um, by far, we had more people respond by that, I mean, come forward to an altar than any other time in the history of our church. Every 7 o'clock service, 9 o'clock service, 11 o'clock service, people responded to the simple presentation of John 3.16. All I said last week was that there's a father who loves you so much that he wants to give his son who will bring to you eternal life. I said that over and over and over. I, that's a repetitive message of Christianity. By the way, we've all heard that before, but I am telling you, there is power in the truth and there is hope in the truth. The truth brings hope and we are living in a world that so desperately needs the hope that comes from eternal life. This week in my devotions, I read Psalm 51, and Psalm 51 is about David's failure with Bathsheba. He actually committed adultery. He, he's someone who frequently attended the 11 o'clock service. I'm, I'm just trying to get you to see that he, that he was a believer. He was a spiritually righteous person. He was a king of Israel. And he, and he committed um, adultery. I don't know what it would be like to compose a song about your failure and then publish it for everybody to sing from generation to generation. That's what David did. He wrote a song about his adultery and how God cleansed him of his adultery. And I like the fact that he doesn't really care what people think about him that much. He only cares what God thinks about so he wrote the song and we got to read it. And his cry in the song is, I want to be clean before God. I, his cry is, I don't want adultery deep in my heart. I don't want my identity as a liar to be deep in my heart. I don't want the fact that I conspired to murder somebody to be deep in my heart. He says, I want your truth deep in my heart. And I think I'll just step away from my notes for a little bit like my dad. <laughs> And, and remind you that just because your spirit has been made alive by the power of Christ's resurrection, that does not necessarily mean that your soul is without trauma, that your soul is without woundedness. There's a lot of people who are worshiping across the Metroplex today, and they are believers. They have been resurrected by faith. The righteousness of God has come to them by personal faith in what Jesus has done. And yet, because somebody sinned against them or because they conspired to sin against somebody else, they're walking around with fears and trauma and depression and physical ailments. And we will not, we cannot prosper unless our soul prospers. And the only way for our soul to prosper is for God's word to be deep in inside us. I'm just trying to say we're not going to grow the glory if we're only picking up the Bible every two or three days and reading a scripture or putting it on the refrigerator. There has to be a group of people who are saying, I, I press toward the reality of having God's truth guide my life. I'm just, I don't know how to say it without, you, you know, I don't know how to say it and be nice. It's time for the people of God to read your Bibles. It is time for you to get in the Bible studies. It is time for you to use God's Word to heal your traumas. Psalm 107.2 says he sent forth his word and heals them. Psalm 119.50 says your word has revived me and given me life. Psalm 33.6 says by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all their host by the breath of his mouth. James 1.21 says receive and welcome the word which implanted and rooted in your hearts contains the power to save your souls. Hebrews 4.12 says, For we have the living word of God, which is full of energy, like a two-edged sword. It will penetrate to the very core of our being, where soul and spirit, bone and marrow meet. If we're going to live prosperously, our soul must prosper, and our soul prospers when the truth of God's word is. 
in us. I, I pledged to the Cedar Hill campus. I did it this morning to the Fair Meadows and the Waxahachie campus. I pledged to the Spanish services, the Saturday night services. Whoever stands in these pulpits, we will preach a word that protects and separates our soul from our spirit, a word that heals, a word that accurately reflects the testimony of Jesus. But that's not enough for your soul to be healed. It's time for the people of God to grow the glory by reading God's word. Yeah. Taking the truth into our inward mind. Number two, what kind of church are we going to be? Not just a word church. We're going to be a power church. We're going to be a place where the supernatural supports the testimony of who Jesus is. Paul says it in 3.3 of Philippians. He said, we will worship God in the power and freedom of the Holy Spirit. In verse 10 of Philippians 3, he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Acts 1.8, I promise this to you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be seized with power and you will be my messengers to Jerusalem throughout Judea, the distant provinces and the remotest places on the earth. Come on, church. I know this to be true. I'm an old guy. I know this to be true. It is easy to build a theology around disappointing experiences. Context is everything. Paul is in jail and he's writing a letter to the church, and he said, I know I'm in jail, but I am running with passion toward the power of the resurrection. During Dad's last days, we all had personal time with him, and one of, during my time with him, I, I was like, Dad, what's your biggest regret? And he says, my biggest regret is that I didn't catalog all of the miracles that have, I personally have been able to see. But we can take care of that because he told all those stories so many times that we all have them memorized. <laughs> you know, my, my brother he was diagnosed with a tumor and, and um, they were taking him to an emergency surgery. And between the diagnosis at the doctor's office and the hospital, the tumor disappeared. I mean, that was just when he was a child. One of the stories Dad told a hundred times was when Sister Wright, one of the old saints of the church, died. And they prayed for her, and she was raised from the dead. And when she came back, she told stories about all the things that she had seen in heaven. He likes to tell the story about Mary Pike. There was another precious saint in one of his churches. She was in a coma for a number of days, and when they prayed for her, she jumped up out of bed and started a Jericho march around the room. Some of you are like, Jericho, what? What is the? We'll have one one day, and that way you'll know what it is. So many financial miracles in our family as a, as a kid. I remember gathering around, you know, our, our needs, our bills, and our parents just praying money in. There's a curse for being prosperous, I'll tell you that. You rely on your jobs, you rely on your blessings, you don't, you don't rely on the Lord, I don't know, I'm just, just talking to you out of my heart. When, one day, um, I injured my kidney, it was contused. My parents were in New England, they were trying to get to me. By the time they got there so that we could have legal permission to take my kidney out, my brother prayed for me, and my kidney was pretty instantly healed. I'm just saying, my dad has a legacy of seeing the super. We've seen too much to settle for a level of glory. We've seen too much. We can't say, okay, now we'll be religious. Now we'll be comfortable for people to want to come in and hang out with us. I pledge to you, in all of these campuses, we will press for signs and miracles and gifts of the Spirit, because if all we have to offer our communities is what we can accomplish in our own strength, we're not offering much to the world. My friend told me about a, a friend of his who was in a demonized situation. She was actually manifesting demons and he called a pastor 
of a, of a nearby spirit-filled church. And listen, I, I am so thankful for every spirit-filled church. I'm not trying to put somebody down so that we can look lifted up. I'm just telling you what happened. My friend called the pastor's wife of that church and said, can you help my friend? She's manifesting demons. And the pastor's wife of that, of that church said, uh, we don't really do that. We've never, we've never cast out a demon before. And I just want to go on record as saying, bring your demons here. <laughs> we, we will do that. I don't mean to sound arrogant. I'm just saying that's what we do. We will grow glory with a culture that says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the glory that is heaven is also in the earth. Love matters most. Love matters most. Love matters most. But we will also be enthusiastic and passionate about spiritual gifts, including gifts of miracles and healings and deliverance and prophecy and whatever else God can do to show his glory. What kind of church are we going to be? Thirdly, we're going to be a fellowship church. The word is in verse 10 of chapter 3. It says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Now, for those of you who were raised in church, fellowship is not the hall in the back of the church where you bring the covered dish dinners <laughs> and eat the fried chicken. Um, I like that. I don't like chicken, but I like the, that hanging out. That's what plunge party is now, I think. But fellowship is, listen, deliberate companionship, wow. relational intentionality. I told you a couple of weeks ago, you can never be Jason Bourne's girlfriend because you'll be shot at. <laughs> and the point of the illustration is that fellowship costs us something. Fellowship is one of the three sacrifices mentioned in the book of Hebrews that was necessary for the early church to have health. There had to be a sacrifice of praise and a sacrifice of fellowship. I forgot what the other one was, actually. I have to read my Bible more. <laughs> but the idea is that when we are deliberate about our relationships, we are willing to absorb the liabilities of the people that we hang out with, and they are willing to absorb our liabilities. And by the way, I'd like to go on record as saying thank you to the people that I know attend this church at great cost. It costs you something to belong here because we are intentional about our relationships saying that every tribe and every tongue, every ethnicity, every social group should be represented here. I know we're on the south side of town. I know we're on the south side of town, but the truth is we have a greater prospect for glory when we give to Jesus the thing his heart yearns for the most, which is one new man, not people clustered around their cultures. <laughs> Just talking, I'm about to get in trouble. <laughs> Had a conversation. I had a conversation with someone, and in, he said, those people have their culture. Why can't we have our culture? Let them go to their culture. We'll stay in our culture. And I'm just saying there is a kingdom culture that transcends all of those cultures. And that's the church we're going to be. That's the church we're going to be. God's glory actually requires participation in the lives of people who are not like ourselves. Around the throne are the wisest 
of all creation with many eyes. And from their angle, they see the glory of the Lord. And they say, holy, holy, holy. And the guy from the east side of the throne says, oh, no, you should see it from my vantage point. It's holy, holy, holy. And the guy from the north says, no, 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 you don't even understand. From my vantage point, it's holy, holy, holy. And from the west side, he says, no, if you could see what I see, you would see holy, holy, holy. I need somebody in my life who is a single mom who can say, let me show you the glory of the Lord from a single mom. Let me show you the glory of God as a student. Let me show you the glory of God from someone who's been oppressed and faced injustice all of their life. I can only know the glory of God when I see it through your eyes. And when I can't see the glory of God for myself, I I really do need to see you see the glory of God. I, I pledge to you, listen, I really want you to enjoy church. I mean, I want you to come and have a good time. But I pledge to you that we will grow the glory by welcoming tax collectors and, and non-religious people and religious people. We will welcome every tribe and we will welcome every tongue. We will, rel- we will welcome every race. None of us deserves his grace. None of us are better than anybody else. It's not us versus them. It's just people who need the heart of a father. And then... What kind of church are we going to be? We're going to be a worship church. Chapter 3, verse 3, we worship God in the power and freedom of the Holy Spirit. Verse 1 says, don't ever limit your joy or fail to rejoice in the wonderful experience of knowing our Lord Jesus. Verse 8, to truly know him means letting go of everything from my past and throwing away all my boasting on the garbage heap. We are those who boast in what Jesus has done. The issue is boasting, you know, boasting is another technical term, and it, and it points to what really anchors your life. What you boast in is what you actually are looking to for security and affirmation and to feel good about yourself. That's what you boast in. And, and so even if you're a believer, you can, you can have anchors that aren't in the glory of God. I mean, I used to, I was saved when I was four years old, but my boast was in my baseball, you know, or my, my boast was in how many kids I had in my youth group when I was a youth pastor, you know. You can boast in your friends. You can boast in the car you drive. You can boast in how much money is in your checking account. But when you grow the glory, your boast is in the Lord. Your boast is in the, your boast is in the Lord. And, and Jesus, you know, he was so concerned about his own disciples, his own disciples who had seen so much supernatural activity. He was so concerned. He says, your hearts are, have become hard. It means calloused. It's like you guys have been handling holy things so much that you've lost your sensitivity. You've got thick skin on your heart, a callous. Same word for cataract. He says your heart has become cataract so that you've been hanging around the glory so much that you've lost your, the brilliance and the brightness has caused your eye to dull. And you don't, you don't see the glory anymore. It's called a hard heart. Jesus was concerned that his own disciples were just developing that. And I just, I just don't want that in my, I just don't want that in my heart. And I don't want it in our, our hearts. So what are we willing to do to be that church? Here's what Paul did. He lost some things. He said, all that I once took credit for, I've forsaken them. I regard it all as nothing. And I, I'm not going to be the Holy Spirit and tell you what you need to lose but it might be an offense at somebody or it might be a religious protocol or it might be the way you think. I don't know what it is. Some of you might need to 
lose some friends because they're dragging you down. I don't know. I don't know what you need to lose, but Paul was willing to lose whatever it took to press to the victory. Um, take hold of some things. He says, I haven't attained it yet, but I'm taking hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. That sounds like ferocity to me. It sounds like discipline. It's like, I'm going to do this. Look, I don't want to make you mad, but we are not going to grow glory if your church attendance is once every two months. If you just, if this is casual for you and you're just like, well, if I feel like it and it's not too cloudy and stuff, we're not going to grow glory like that. We're not going to grow glory if you're just, just handing tips to the Lord financially, if you're not showing up on Tuesday night for the prayer meetings. We're not going to grow glory. We'll grow religion. He says, I'm going to take hold of this. I'm going to do something about it. The third thing he did was he lived in what he had already attained. He said, I haven't attained the fullness, but I have something. I have a measure of faith. I have an anointing from the Holy One. I have a heart that's been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I have a new nature. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living in me. I am a priest and a king. I am part of a holy nation. I have a stewardship of the things that God has given me. If you're one of those guys, oh, well, I got wounded a decade ago and my job is to go sit and, you know, just kind of spectate. Literally, I'm not quitting church. I'm going to be, oh, God bless you. Thank you for not quitting. <laughs> Take hold. Live in what you have. Use what God has put in you. His glory is in you. And then finally, Paul was willing to do it together. 315, so let all who are fully mature have the same passion. If anyone is not yet gripped by these desires, God will reveal it to him. Let us advance together to reach this victory prize, following one path with one passion. One path with one passion. So the scene that has most impacted my heart this week was the scene where we were, we were watching Dad transition. He was getting baptized. He was leaving his mortality, coming into his immortality, from this level of glory to the new level of glory. Listen, if you lose something to get more glory, what you've lost is worth it. So anyway, we were all of the families. I kind of felt bad for dad because he's just laying there. He's not really cognitive of anything that's going on and we're all just standing around watching him die. And uh, the nurse counted down his breaths. The last three minutes, three minutes before he passed, he had three breaths. Two minutes before he passed, he had two breaths. One minute before he passed, he had one breath. And then he wasn't breathing anymore, but we could still see the heart beating and the pulse. And it slowed down and it slowed down and finally it, it stopped. And I don't know if that sounds gross to you, but the truth is, it was so peaceful. It was so wonderful. And here we were all in the room, family members from everywhere, voted for different people, don't believe in the same food or anything. But we were holding hands and we were, and I'm just saying that if we could focus on who Jesus is and what he's done for us, and really unite our lives together. We would grow in amazing glory around here. We would grow in amazing glory. And I'm just asking you to do that. I'm asking you to put on your press. Put on your press. And not settle for all the good things. How many of you know you've already been blessed? Come on, are we blessed? We're blessed. We're blessed. But this is, not, this is not what we're settling for because there's a new level of glory. And the next time I preach to you, I will have a sermon to talk about that. Today was a talk out of my heart. Stand. Stand together, please. That's a good song. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child. In my 
my father's house there's a place for me I'm a child of God yes sir uh, let me just warn you that in the first service when we started singing this people started leaving and I yelled at them I lost my temper <laughs> right got witnesses here you can't leave when we're worshiping God you can't leave when heaven and earth is meeting. You can't, you cannot grow the glory. You cannot grow the glory if the most important thing for you is to be the first out of the parking lot. There has to be, I know, I know. It's my fault that you have to arrive late because I preached too long in the first service and you don't have parking places, so you have to wait. I'll take that. But I am not taking that you come to the 11 o'clock service and leave when we start getting into an altar call. That is not good. That is not good. So you have to stay. You have to stay until we say the blessing, all right? I'm just seconds away from saying the blessing. But I'm asking you to check your vital signs. If you're not hungry for a new level of glory, please don't leave without letting God give you the grace for that. If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, there'll never be a better time than right now to say, Jesus, I want your life in me. I want who you are to come inside me. That can happen right now, but, but I'm mostly talking to believers today that are just like, I'm not going to settle for this. I don't... If I'm in prison, I'm in prison. I'm, okay, get me out, God, when it's time. But while I'm in prison, let me write some letters to somebody so that, so that the joy and the glory of God can increase. Amen? Amen? Lift your heart with your hands, would you please? Oh, God, we refuse to settle for the level of glory that we've experienced when we know you've called us for more. Come on, help me pray. God, send your glory. Send your glory to the earth, from the heaven to the earth. Let our faces shine in the middle of being stoned. Let the things we don't understand, it doesn't matter if we understand them or not. Let your glory come to our prison cells. Oh God, help us to live not only in who you are, but in who we are. We are the glory of God in the earth. So Lord, thank you for, thank you for a grace that stirs us past religion. The glory that transfigures us. And we're ready to go to a new level, Jesus. Send your glory. Come on, say it out loud, everybody. Send your glory. Come on, say it three times. Send your glory. Send your glory. Send your glory. Jesus. Jesus. Send your glory, Lord. Let's sing it. Sing it one more time, please. Whom the sun sets yeah. free. Yeah, come on. Oh, it's free. for people listen if you if you if you don't have a relationship with Jesus please don't leave without without that 
but I'm assuming that most of the people here are, are you have a, you're gonna go to heaven. And, and then here's what I wanna pray. Those of you who have had your spirit man awakened by the same spirit that raised Jesus, you're saved, but your soul is damaged. You got, you got hurt by, maybe by me got hurt by a religious activity. You got, uh, there's a sin that you feel condemnation or somebody sinned against you and the damage remains in your soul. Can I just say by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's time to move on. And it's time, it's time for you to be free as a child of God from the, from the trauma. You, it is an incoherence for you to be a, a, to have the residency of Jesus in you and to be carrying a, what, the, what Paul calls a carnal mind, a mind, a thought process that is damaged by something that happened in the earth. When you're spiritually minded, you have life and peace. So who would say, who would have the courage to be like David and say, I don't really care what people think, I care what God thinks. I don't want my trauma to be deep in my heart. I want his truth to be deep in my heart. Raise your hand right now. And so, all right, hold your hands up. Father, in the name of Jesus, there is a canopy of healing over this house right now. There is a virtue for the souls of men and women. There is an impartation of divine help for our souls. And Father, there are people who have come to the service today and they are gonna leave in a new dimension of freedom because they are very specific. They know the trauma of their soul. And I'm asking in the name of Jesus for our souls to be healed so that we can prosper. There can be a new dimension of glory that will not be tarnished by damaged souls. So Jesus, I speak the power of the resurrection into our soul. I speak the love of God and the and the and the oil, the balm of the Holy Spirit to heal wounded souls. It's okay that we've suffered. It's okay that we have a fellowship of suffering. We are going to press for the glory. So we decree our freedom now. Come on, dec declare it. I am free. I am free. My soul is healed. Now, I, I, somebody's going to go, oh, pastor, you're so simplistic. We need counseling. We need therapy. I am all for counseling and all for therapy. But I am also for the power of God that can touch you and make you whole. Can make you whole. It can make you whole. It can heal you. Your soul can be healed. All right. Lord bless you. Thank you for staying for all that. The Lord bless you and keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you. Give you grace and peace now and forever.